Namaste. So, in spiritual life, <laughs> sometimes there's a need to fight. And when that happens, one must have weapons, spiritual weapons. Now, of all the spiritual weapons, oh, first I want to say, my astrologer told me about this time, which is coming now that it will be like a volcanic eruption. And particularly for certain people, <laughs> that the energy is going to be like uh, trying to ride a rocket. So I'm getting ready for that. So there are two spiritual weapons, ultimate weapons. Hmm. Uh, one is like a black hole and the other is like a white hole. They're both singularities, but one is of emptiness and the other is of fullness. So these two weapons, when they are introduced into the manifestation, <laughs> cause immense havoc. Well, and uh, why is that? Because they are absolute. Just like a fusion bomb, hydrogen bomb, introduces into the Earth atmosphere the uh, nature of the sun, uh, the atomic fusion at the core, at the heart of the sun. So, in other words, it takes it out of the place where it occurs naturally and brings it into a level of manifestation that is much, much more dense, much lower energy than uh, this new material, this, this very active, higher energy material. It would be if you could grab a bucket from the heart of the sun and throw it into a city, it would de devastate it. In the same way, a fusion bomb. Uh, it's a different state of matter. It's all plasma. It's only high energy, uh, high temperature, ionized nuclei, right? All the electrons radiate away as, as electromagnetism. And then you're just left with pure energy, practically. The next thing to pure energy. In the same way, when you introduce an absolute Brahman into the relative world, it um, <laughs> consumes the very fabric of that world, which is duality. So these ultimate weapons of, of the Vedas are, um, they're like that. <laughs> When they are introduced into the relative situation, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Ultimate entropy occurs. So the Brahmastra, the Brahmastra is like the heart of the sun, Brahman, being introduced directly into the relativistic, dualistic, manifestation. And of course, it just blasts everything uh, to nothing. It consumes everything. Mm. But it's a kind of fullness of energy. Uh, it just burns it out very quickly. Boom! And it's gone. Uh, and uh, the Brahmastra is also very, very particular. You can direct it at a specific person or a specific uh, entity of any kind, actually. But, of course, <laughs> the Brahmastra, you know, don't try this at home, kids, right? <laughs> I first discovered this principle in my 20s. 
when I was duplicating the orgon experiments of Wilhelm Reich. And um, I, I got all the way to the point of uh, duplicating a certain experiment where he, he mixes these two energies together that are very incompatible. And he got a, a extremely uh, disruptive, dis, uh, destructive result. But I decided not to go through with it because, <laughs> you know, uh, I had verified all his work up to that point. So it's pretty sure that that was also correct. And I didn't want to go there. <laughs> that was the first time I encountered the phenomenon. But then later on, about seven years ago, I inadvertently set off another Brahmastra, <laughs> the effects of which are still reverberating around the internet somewhere. Um, when I tried to introduce or seriously inquire into uh, Sringara Rasa in the uh, spontaneous mode of pure bhakti. And um, that set off an explosion that's <laughs> still, still ringing in my ears <laughs> today. And uh, so what I learned from that is that you have to be very, very cautious and very, very focused in your application of this particular weapon. So what is it in practice? Well, the, the story of the Brahmastra weapon in modern days is that uh, Ramana Maharshi had this question, who am I? What am I? Whence am I? How did I come to be? Huh? What's the meaning of all this? <laughs> and to inquire into that, not intellectually, but experientially. And this, uh, of course, will stop any ego thought in its tracks. Just splat. <laughs> This is an extremely uh, focused and uh, piquant example of the Brahmastra on a social level, on a human level. Huh? That when you bring in the light of pure Brahman, the, the knowledge of, uh, of uh, Kevala Dvaita uh, into the conversation, it just stops everything else cold, yeah. annihilates it, because all relativity vanishes. And what appeared to be is no more. Boom. So he, he would use this, and the devotees, sometimes the devotees, you know, they're trying to clarify a certain point, say for a book or a uh, uh, some teaching they had to do or something. And they're trying to ask him, and he would bring up this question, well, you know, <laughs> who is having this experience? Or who has this desire? Or who is trying to do this or that or get the result or whatever? Who is that? Uh -huh. and, and then the devotees would say, oh, no, Bhagavan, stop. <laughs> if you use your Brahmastra, the whole thing becomes meaningless. And we can't continue. So in practice, we use the Brahmastra, Ramana's Brahmastra, whenever anybody tries to create too much duality, too much restriction on the possibilities, uh, too much uh, uh, reduction of freedom. Uh, they, they make a really bad deal, you know, a, a really bad offer. Well, we can always bring up the Brahmastra. And this serves to defeat and neutralize almost all of the agents of Maya that come to distract us, uh, except for one. <laughs> and that is the neo -Adwaitans. The neo have learned the incantation of the Brahmastra. Who am I? 
They haven't realized it, but they know their lines. Huh? They've studied the books again and again. Huh? I am knowing. <laughs> so look, when you try to, uh, how can I say, help one of these people, which is very hard to do because, you know, if you're God, you don't need to listen to anybody, right? But see, there's a difference between authentic Advaita and neo-Advaita. And the difference philosophically is the difference between Kevala Advaita, non-duality, and monism, or oneness. Advaita doesn't mean oneness. Advaita means non-duality, and there's a world of difference. But it's too subtle for the average person to distinguish. So we have to help them. Okay, especially the people who get caught up in the neo-Advaita uh, fabrication. That the enlightenment is more than just attaining oneness. It's more than just erasing all distinctions. Uh, it's more than, even more than attaining a direct realization of Brahman. Let me ask you this. Okay, Shiva is the knower of Brahman. Huh? There is no greater self-realized soul than Shiva. He is Brahman for all practical purposes. He's Ishwara. He is everything except Brahman itself, of course. But what happens when Brahman comes into the manifestation? He accepts a form, and that form is Shiva. Shiva is Tatashta. Tatashta means on the borderline. He's neither this nor that. He is neither Brahman, nor is he an entity of the creation. He's somewhere in between. It's inexplicable. <laughs> but what does he do? He expands Maya. He projects the duality of the creation. To do this, he doesn't have to change. He just becomes it. He's not conscious of it. He is it. So, what happens in practice is there's this super wonderful, extremely uh, nectarian esoteric, erotic relationship between Shiva and Maya, isn't it? Look deep into the scriptures and you find they have these wonderful and, and astonishing pastimes, you know, or they're very sweet and full of rasa, nectar. And this rasa is in the Sringara mood. Romantic love, erotic love, those sentiments, those feelings, and those actions. Name and form and pastimes. So when this occurs in the life of the avatar, the God-man, the uh, fully self-realized sage, huh? when he channels this into the material world, even though he is a consummate jnani, even though he is fully realized on the non-dual level, he manifests as a bhakta, he manifests as a devotee of a specific form of God in the conjugal mood. There are other moods as well, but Sringara Ras, the conjugal, romantic, erotic relationship 
with the supreme is the root of the tree of rasa. It's called Adi Rasa, the original, because all other rasas are contained within it. Now, I, I did a small segment on rasa in the Ananya Bhakti series. So I'm not going to go into that all again. But basically, there are five main rasas, seven subsidiary rasas, hundreds of, of flavors of mixtures of all of these. Huh? And all of them have Brahman at their core. In other words, the form of the beloved becomes a proxy for the devotee's passion, romantic passion, for Brahman itself, for non-duality. Because, of course, this is the first thing you want to do when you get into duality is get out of it, right? <laughs> Ow! <laughs> it's like dipping your toe in cold water. Huh? And you know you're going to have to dive in. <laughs> Right, But when the uh, devotee embraces Brahman, the, the proxy of Brahman, in the form of the Ishta Devata, uh, the romantic ideal, the uh, chosen form of the beloved, when he embraces this form within the heart in meditation or through a proxy in a tantric ritual, he experiences the same bhavas, the same emotional ecstasies. So we see uh, so many examples besides Ramana, uh, Ramakrishna, uh, and so many others, going back to the gopis. Gopis are the prime example of this. Now, what does this have to do with Neo-Advaita? Neo-Advaitans don't understand any of this because they haven't done the karma and bhakti yoga necessary to realize it for themselves. They skip over the uh, study of those scriptures because they consider them too elementary to merit their attention. After all, God doesn't need to learn anything. Ha ha ha. Bullshit. Because I, I spoke on this a little bit in a video called Jump Up, Fall Down in the Esoteric Teaching Series, which you really should watch because it's the background to all of this stuff I'm saying here. That if you haven't a uh, firm background, in karma yoga and bhakti yoga, you can't even afford to become a full-time yogi. You'll have too much uh, mundane karma on your plate that has to be assimilated. And it'll, it'll track you down. It'll get you, you know. You think the people driving those nice cars and living in those beautiful houses don't have any worries? No, they have bigger worries, that's all. <laughs> to match their desires and ambitions. Whereas the humble sage sits under a tree and has no desire at all. So, and no worries either. See? And one who can enter this trance, transcendental uh, trance of a conjugal enjoyment with his beloved Lord also is released from all the suffering, all the karma. Because he knows he's not the body as experience. So what does this all have to do with Pashupatastra? Well, Pashupatastra is simply asking the question of the Neo-Advaitans, what is the meaning of the uh, Acharyas like Ramana and Ramanuja and even Shankaracharya and going all the way back to Shukadev and Vyas and beyond back back to the original Vedic sages that they manifested this mood, devotional mood and activities. I mean, one of the first things Shankaracharya wrote was Bhajagovindam. 
Huh? So, the devotional life is the foundation of full self-realization. And we see in the absence of complete development of devotion, the ecstasy of devotion, huh? ideally supported by tantric rituals, uh, to give reality and substance to the Advaita teaching, that these people do not reach the actual realization. They don't have their chakras fully open, and they, they can't manifest the presence necessary to receive the grace that is always present everywhere. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Aum. Oh.